first came across to you when I heard about Mind Lab and I thought, wow, what's this? This thing that seems to be the first uh, government innovation agency. And I think it started in 2002 when you directed it from 2007 to 2014 and now are directing the Danish Design Centre. But let's just forget that for the moment because I'm really interested in who you are. So um, my mother is Danish and my father was American until he immigrated. And he met my mom at um, a university where he was teaching and she was a student. And so um, then he stayed and um, they got married and had me and my brother. And basically that means I, I grew up in a, in a family uh, in Denmark, but with a very strong uh, relationship to the United States. And also, in many ways, a global outlook because of sort of this international element in my in my uh, childhood. Right. Uh, the other thing I thought quite interesting when we had a chat was that you played with this game as an eight-year-old with your brother onwards, eight till twelve, which I think was called Logo, which is now yes. called Scratch. Yeah, I mean, so I think so. My, I grew up with um, in a family and with my dad, who was very interested in computers and in uh, the potential of using uh, computers for learning and education and uh, very early on uh, I in my home we had you know microcomputers in the 70s early 80s where very few people had access to that and um, in a sense my brother and I were kind of guinea pigs and saying so how far can kids go with with this programming and uh -huh. coding was uh, back then it was just called programming and uh -huh. I learned how a visual language uh, could um, be a learning vehicle and could be a way to to combine, you know, mathematics of, of computer software with sort of creativity and creation. You also said you were very active in democratic movements and, and so on. Can you just say a few words about that? Yeah, so when I was, um, uh, when I graduated from high school and, be and also started university was in the early 90s when the Berlin Wall came down and the uh, Soviet bloc collapsed. And I, was, uh, I started studying uh, political science, and I was really interested in the changes in the world going on um, at a time which was in many ways very optimistic. And country after country uh, looked to democracy, looked to the European Union. And so as a, as a leader in, the, um, in one of the student unions, uh, national student unions in Denmark, I was uh, the uh, international secretary. And for a couple of years, I worked very extensively with um, uh, young people, students in uh, the Baltic states especially on sort of how to build democratic uh, youth uh -huh. organizations and student organizations. And I think so for me, that period all had to do with change. It also had to do with actually building organizations and, and creating something uh, better. Uh, and then you went to Ramble, which is a, a very well known, perhaps the biggest Danish consultancy. And you obviously learned various things there. You were talking about the analytical skills and the rigor and so on. Just tell me a bit about the good side and perhaps what else you thought about the Ramble experience? I, I got to know the company by by being actually an editor for them and you know, I've always loved writing and so I actually was first an editor of their the, the company newsletter and later on became an intern and then uh, became a consultant. One of the lessons from that period was was what does it mean to create a good organization and uh, you know sometimes consultancies are known for being ruthless and uh, opera out systems and uh, and uh, extremely hard working and we did work hard but it was a company that cared for people and that had quite a balanced uh, work life that also was concerned with the bigger things around creating a maybe a more sustainable society and actually the company ultimately is foundation owned which means being foundation owned you can take a longer view of your role in society than only profits and return to shareholder and being part of that kind of ethos and and also really good management and um, close uh, good leadership became formative for me. You, you were also saying that Ramble allowed you to sort of experiment in various ways that a, a, a traditional company may not have done. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I back then I, I, you know, I got a new role and played that role in from from the US. But then I, I came back and got interested in both in, in, in leadership uh, quite a lot and also in innovation. And uh, when I when it when it when it struck me that 
the idea of innovation and the concept of innovation was very foreign to government. And we were advising governments on all kinds of things. I yeah. thought, well, that should be a, a business area. We should, we, why don't we work with that? And why don't we study it and, and, and build it and uh, propose it and so on? So I did a piece of research within Rumble back in, um, in 2005, uh, which basically was the foundation for my, my, my career today because I studied uh, within the company uh, how our clients saw the idea of innovation in government. And we uh -huh. published a report on that that we self self published and financed. And then um, shortly after that, there was an opportunity to join, uh, to lead MindLab. And, um, and suddenly I thought, well, now it's time to try something different. And I remember when I was being recruited that someone, a director told me, you know, this, this may not pay as much as, you know, you get paid in the private sector going forward, but, but this is your opportunity to kick ass. And I was like, all right, all right that's a pretty, <laughs> I'll, 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 try, I'll go with that. So MindLab was conceived as a platform for creativity within the Ministry of Business. And it was yeah. conceived to sort of provide a different kind of power into creative policy making and also actually underpinning uh, project work, which was very new in ministries at that time. So I have a lot of respect for the individuals who conceived originally in 2001, 2002, when it was launched of MindLab. It became sort of a supporting or facilitating body for project work across the ministry and also introduced um, at least, you know, degrees of graphic design and, and sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, creative work. However, the notion of being user-driven or citizen-centered uh, was not really there yet. And when I came or was recruited, there, you know, it seemed the model had run out of steam um, after the first couple of years of sort of enthusiasm. And um, also the idea that MindNet was, was in a big way a creative space or physically creative space that looked and felt very, very different than the rest of the ministry but maybe not as much a space that was very sharp on terms of methods and tools and approaches. So uh -huh. I thought that all of that was something I could bring in. In your work at MindLab, are there a couple of projects you particularly remember or are proud of or, you know, were uh, sort of emblematic? I think we did two projects early on that became pretty formative and where we learned a lot, but also became pretty iconic for us. One was um, uh, very citizen focused because the Ministry of Employment quickly became a partner. And we looked with we worked with uh, how injured workers in Denmark experienced their case management and spent a lot of time with with workers themselves, uh -huh. videoing their experience, uh, interviewing them, and sort of really creating very powerful insights that challenged the, the the agency for for injured workers to transform its services and and rethink how it how it dealt with with their cases and how it dealt with the outcomes, which were you now very very legal at that time, but where they re realized that there was also the question of, of leveraging the empathy with their experience and, and giving people back to work and rehabilitating people. One of the words we haven't used yet, although it sort of seems to be embedded in everything you're doing, is, is, is design thinking. Um, and you, you've described that very sharply. Right. And of course, if you Google design thinking, you can find a hundred different definitions. Um, so to me, design thinking is um, uh, a process of systematic creativity that takes um, uh, users or people as its uh, starting point and end point. Uh -huh. And um, it's a, an iterative process, experimental, uh, often very visual in nature. Uh -huh. And uh, finally, as its outcome has graphics, products, services, or systems. Um, and finally, the purpose of design thinking and design work can be both commercial and social which means that the competencies and, and tools of designers can be leveraged both for uh, creating business growth and differentiation and uh, competition, or can be leveraged to create societal outcomes, uh, outcomes for people and for planet. Just a, a, a quick uh, detour that I'm, I'm hearing that in the United States these days, where, where there's more at stake right now than the coronavirus, but, but, uh, but uh, uh, very big societal discussion on on race and uh, and equality. Uh, some are calling for and actually taking steps to uh, uh, build new police departments from scratch. Yeah, and Minneapolis, for example. Exactly, it was just decided by the by the by the city council apparently. And so with that, I'll say that we have designed the organizations, the institutions, and their products and services 
that we have today. Yeah. And to the extent that we've designed some that are dysfunctional, uh, bad for the planet or bad for people, we can redesign them. Or maybe we can even design them all over uh, from scratch. And so my interest these days is, and, and my experience is that as we did at MindLab, there was a lot of redesign, you know, a lot of taking something that's already there in terms of services mm -hmm. for citizens, regulations, so on, and looking at how can we improve them through citizen insights and, and design methods and design processes to a point where I think that some of our institutions and some of our uh, sectors, in, 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 in not least in the public sector, might be ready for a new design. Uh, yeah. or what is also called idealized design, which means how what, how would you design it again if, yeah. if you didn't have all the legacy and the yeah, history? Yeah, what if? And let's take all the knowledge we have today, all the skills, all the technology, all the insights, all the learnings we have, our collective intelligence, and put that together and then build something better. So now that we've learned that we can change things by design and we can, by the way, we can also design digital uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence and, and, and very, very rapidly create products and services that go to scale. We now have to take on the responsibility of being, you know, so design savvy, both responsibilities of creating good organizations, but but first and foremost of, of the responsibility of, of leaving our, our society and our planet better, you know, for the next generation. So that becomes a very, very big, you could say big idea which is what's the power of the science to transform? What I like, I think we all like, is, is this ethical foundation that you're talking, which anchors you and in a sense guides you with strategic principles. And so you can be tactically flexible because you know you've always got an ethical anchor. But you've linked, I think also, uh, you know, different definitions of what is capital, what is value, um, you know, obviously in the environmental thing and the inclusive thing. Yeah. So first of all, of all, when we work with scenarios or what we call scenario design, it's, it's sort of, we, we're beginning to call them uh, living futures, which means that if you want to take responsibility for the future, you have to be able to imagine what might happen. And you have yeah. to imagine what might happen from a human perspective, not just from a systems perspective or from an analytical perspective. So this idea of living futures has become quite central in at least some of our work, also in exploring what design methods can do. Uh, perhaps just a final question um, is really storytelling, because to some extent, many people, us probably included, we're, we're talking to the people we know and uh, usually professionals and so on. But how do you how do you communicate in an iconic way? I mean, you know, the difference between iconic communication where you get it in one and then you understand it later versus a narrative story where you really have to analyze, which perhaps is not so immediately compelling. So what do you think about storytelling in terms of the issues we're talking about? What we think is powerful in, in that work is bringing stories into you know, future uh, options or future worlds. And again, when I look back in my own life, I mean, growing up with, um, uh, listening to stories, uh, reading uh, a lot, um, being very curious, um, being told stories uh, when I grew up, uh, and also starting to write stories. So I think I've always been interested in the big questions. You know, the the, the story back then was, you know, is there life on another planet, uh, on 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 Titan, that is, yeah. and um, and was that plausible? Maybe slightly back then. And today that, you know, storytelling is, is a highly powerful way to galvanize and motivate both um, those you want to affect, which are outside of my organization today, but also internally in bringing meaning and sense making to what you do. And I think we can always get better at it. I, I wouldn't presume that I'm the best storyteller in this field, but uh, I try, we try. And I think there are still a lot of very, very important stories to explore and to tell uh, as the world evolves, and I, I loved uh, taking part in that. You've got a book there. Show me. Okay, so I actually have two. So, so I wanted to show this one, which is the the sort of the book that's been the, maybe the one best known that I wrote on, on leading public sector innovation and and how to use design and co-creation in that context. And I, I think of it because uh, one of the reviews it got uh, back when it was published was from a professor. I think it was in Canada who's, who who wrote after a very very long review. He said, "I'm not sure." I agree with everything this guy, Christian, is saying, but he surely seems to believe it himself. <laughs>
And I saw that as a pretty positive review, actually, because I mean, at least uh, at least he believes that I believe it. Um, and I think the, the the force of that of believing and and insisting on a on a better world and how you might create it, I think has has quite some merit. And uh, that's probably um, what my uh, my job is about. Thank you.